So the next thing on the bench is a piece of test equipment and it's an electronic voltmeter. And for those playing along at home, the model number is a TF2604 and this is made by the Marconi Instruments Company. And if we take a look at the name on the tin, it does say that this is an, an electronic voltmeter. Now of course we're all really familiar with electronic voltmeters these days. I mean, uh, here's a flute meter, you've probably got a digital meter on this bench. Here's another flute meter. So, um, Electronic voltmeters like this are actually very common. Uh, in fact, if you were trying to buy an analog meter, maybe something like this, uh, this AVO meter, it would actually be quite difficult to buy an AVO meter th these days, or in fact any analog meter, because uh, pretty much everybody's buying digital meters like this. So really, we're all very spoiled the fact that we can buy these very cheap kind of digital meters for uh, not a lot of money. I mean, these flute meters are relatively expensive, but you can actually buy a, a really good DVM for probably not, not much more than £20 these days. But back in the day, people didn't have these electronic voltmeters. They were using things like the, uh, the AVO. Now, you might say, well, what's the big deal between an electronics, an electronic voltmeter or uh, an AVO meter? Well, it's something that they actually call input impedance. But to give you an introduction to input impedance, what you've got to imagine here for this uh, analog meter is that we've basically got an analog meter movement. So what's in here? We've got a coil of wire and some magnets. And basically what happens is when you try to measure your voltage, your voltage goes to the meter movement. It's actually the current. It's actually the current flowing through a coil of wire which actually repels against a magnet and it actually makes the needle move over. So your actual meter here, to actually measure the voltage, it actually has to pull, it has to pull current from your circuit. And when it pulls current from the circuit, it can actually affect the voltage measurement. So the input impedance of something like uh, an AVO, I think from memory, these are something like uh, 20,000 ohms per volt. And uh, the input impedance varies depending on which of the range, voltage range you have the meter set to. Now the input impedance of uh, most digital meters like this, I'm going to guess that they're uh, something like 10 mega ohms. But this electronic voltmeter, well they call it an electronic voltmeter here. Hmm, I would actually call this something called a VTVM, which is a valve tube voltmeter. Now the input impedance of this is much higher. It's probably much higher than this. Uh, I mean, it's not untypical to find VTM voltmeters that have an input impedance of, it could be up to 100 mega ohm or even more. So these actually draw tiny amounts of power from your circuit. Now, a lot of circuits, it won't really matter whether uh, you connect an AVO to it, an electronic voltmeter or a flute meter, you'll get a similar reading but some circuits, it could really have a big effect on it. So again, we'll take a look at that later. But I guess before we even get into that, we actually have to uh, see if this electronic voltmeter works because uh, this is one that I've just bought. It hasn't got a plug on it. Um, why did I buy it? Well, ooh, I've got to admit, I don't really know. These are kind of obsolete technology. They're not particularly useful anymore. I think the reason I bought it is because I've read and heard a lot about valve tube voltmeters. But amazingly enough, I've never actually owned one before, so I've actually just bought this to have a play with it and see what it operates like. So, uh, I don't know, let's see if we can get it working. So you can see here, we've got rather a spaghetti collection of wires which are actually popping out of the voltmeter. So I guess that's another thing actually, that these all these wires for the, uh, for the various types of probes, these are actually all hard wired. So of course, again, we're used to using meters where you can just unplug the lead. Well, these test leads are all wired in. So this comes with, um, well, two probes. So this probe here, um, this one is what you would use for you know general voltage measurements and stuff like that. I can see it's got a switch on it and the switch says, I think it's got an ohm symbol and a, a volt symbol. Now I haven't bothered to read the manual for this yet. So I'm guessing when you want to measure volts, you probably set it to volts. And when you want to measure ohms, you probably must set it to the ohms. So what you do is this is the, uh, this is the minus lead. This is the, the, the equivalent of the black lead on a voltmeter. So you would clip this onto the chassis of the piece of equipment you were working on. And then you could actually just take different voltage measurements and I'm guessing they would be displayed on here. So whenever we want to measure a DC voltage or in fact resistance, we use this uh, stylus pen probe. And uh, that pen probe, it's used in conjunction with this uh, common wire, this common lead that goes back to the instrument. But interestingly enough, the instrument doesn't actually allow you to use this stylus pen probe for uh, AC measurements. It actually 
forces you to use this strange looking thing. Now in the manual it does talk about AC measurements but I would actually call this, rather than calling this an AC probe, I think I would probably call this an RF probe because really the aim of this instrument isn't for measuring you know mains at at uh, 50 hertz it's actually meant to measure signals up to something like 1.5 gigahertz now back in the day that must have been a, an amazingly high frequency and certainly you couldn't buy scopes or probably spectrum analyzers or pretty much any other equipment that could measure up to 1.5 gigahertz although having said that i suspect there was very few people operating on frequencies near that anyway but this is this probe is really designed to measure very high frequencies. It's not really designed to measure things like mains at 50 hertz and uh, there is actually a derating factor for measuring low frequencies. Now although it will actually show a low frequency measurement on the meter movement you actually have to apply a derating factor so it does actually specify that the lowest frequency you can actually use is 20 hertz but even at 50 hertz you still have to apply this derating factor which basically means that if you was to measure 50 hertz mains on this the actual signal would appear on the meter it would appear a little bit lower than it really was so you have to apply this uh, this correction factor to the measurements. Where this probe really starts to earn its keep is for, for high frequency measurements. Anything over one megahertz, the actual meter reading will be comparatively flat anywhere between, well, almost between one and, as I say, 1.5 gigahertz, but it doesn't work too well at the lower end. Now the way that this probe works is actually quite clever because it's difficult to send very low level high frequency signals down long lengths of cabling. You get all kinds of strange effects. What they actually do is the trick is to convert the AC RF waveform. What they do is they convert it to DC. So you have effect a detector probe. They have a diode inside the, the head of this probe and uh, that converts the AC signal to a DC signal. And of course this meter is very good at measuring DC. So that's, that's absolutely no problem. Now whenever you are measuring high frequency signals, things like the length of your connecting cables can have a massive effect. This is the common ground strap. Now a few inches of cable to a high frequency signal, they'll look massively inductive. They'll actually look like a very high value of resistance to a high frequency signal. So you have to keep the lengths of cable down to an absolute minimum. So what they actually do with this probe here, as you can see it's got this uh, funny little clip on the side here. Well this is designed to have a very short length of wire so that the length of the ground return it's probably only about an inch long. You actually cut the wire, you make it as short as possible and then you just touch the very tip of it here to the circuit that's under test. So you would almost be, uh, you'd almost be using this flat down to a circuit board with a very short length of connecting cable. That's the only way you could actually measure high frequencies. Now the other effect of course that you have on high frequencies is uh, capacitance. If you have a lot of capacitance or a very high frequency that effectively looks like a short circuit to high frequency waveforms. So it's important to make the capacitance as low as possible. So the capacitance of this probe it's only two picofarads and uh, it's a tiny amount of capacitance that. And again, that's the other thing that allows this probe to be used at uh, very high frequencies. Now, for example, the typical capacitance of something like an oscilloscope is maybe 20 picofarads, but the reality is with the leads and other connecting wires, it can be anywhere between five and 100 picofarads. So those high values of capacitance, again, they can be a problem when you're working at high frequencies. So that's why they designed this probe to be as low a capacitance and have the connecting leads to be very low inductance. That's that's why they employ these little tricks. Now I believe that this electronic voltmeter it does actually have valves inside it, so it operates from uh, from high voltages. So rather than just plugging it in like a valve radio, I think it's probably a good idea if we just take the cover off it and uh, just make sure that there's nothing getting you know, you know no bulging capacitors because uh, I don't want it to just explode before we've had a chance to play with it. Of course, the other thing I'm a bit concerned about is to make sure that the meter movement's in good condition because, uh, yeah, if the meter doesn't work on this, well, that's game over, isn't it? Now, apart from being a little bit grubby, it doesn't actually look as though it's in a, it's too bad a condition, this. 
Well I've just gone ahead and I've given this a little bit of a clean and it looks more presentable and I'm guessing I've probably removed at least 70% of the coronavirus that it was probably covered in but while I was cleaning it I did actually spy the notice on the back here and uh, I mentioned the input impedance well maybe I can bring you in there's actually a label under here and it actually says that the DC input impedance the input resistance of this particular meter it says it's 103 mega ohms and the 103 looks as though it's been a uh, it's kind of been pressed in like a, a dymo label so I'm guessing that this was probably tested at the back at the factory and uh, you know they're saying that the input impedance is 103 mega ohms so we'll have to go have a go at testing that I think I'm guessing that the way to get inside this is to uh, take the feet off it. I don't know if it's a bad sign that these feet seem loose, so it seems as though somebody's maybe been inside this recently, which uh, could mean that it's been uh, totally molested, or you never know. It could be that uh, somebody's been inside it and done an absolutely perfect job of restoring this, and <laughs> let's find out. Is that going to slide out? Oh, that would probably come loose now. I wonder what else is holding it. No, I think that's coming out, isn't it? He said. Okay, I think we're getting there. Well, as I often say about this time, this thing again is a, well, it's a thing of absolute beauty. It's a beautifully manufactured, uh, all hand manufactured. You can see that it's all got hand looming on the wiring here. So somebody took some time to build this. Um, looking at, just looking at it, we can actually see we've got a huge number of uh, adjustment points, variable resistors, potentiometers. So it looks as though we can do quite a bit of a, uh, calibration just looking at it 10 30 100 300 i think that that probably corresponds with the uh, ranges on the front here does it yeah okay it does so uh it looks as though yeah we've got it says got a dc section we've got an ac section not sure how you calibrate the ohms on it interesting that it's actually using uh printed circuit boards Well, it's a good sign that it doesn't actually look as though it's been got at, but I can actually see some, uh, well, I've got some capacitors here which are well, the Plessy capacitors, so we've got a 500 microfarad capacitor, and uh, we've got some of these uh, blue ones which are, I usually call them Philips, I don't know if it is a Philips or not, I don't know. So I'm guessing that this board at the back here, this looks like the uh, power supply board because I can see that a lot of the connections from the transformer down here appear to go onto this back board. And uh, we've got some quite large smoothing capacitors. I can also see some diodes down here. And uh, so I'm guessing that this probably uses a, a solid state bridge arrangement. I can also see that we've got a couple of valves here and uh, I can't read the lettering on the top valve, but I can see that the valve underneath has got the numbers on it, AO2. Now I think I recognise that AO2 number because I think that's a voltage reference tube. Now if my memory serves me correctly, I think it was an AO2 tube which was used in the uh, trio receiver. I think they actually use that to stabilise the HT supply to the VFO so that it doesn't drift in frequency as the voltage changes. And again from memory, I think that these reference valves, they work a lot like a Zener diode in that basically they don't really pass any current through them until you hit a certain voltage and then they start to conduct more heavily so they are used as a form of shunt regulator so I'm guessing that this uh, valve again it's used as a shunt regulator to provide a reference valve and I'm guessing that this uh, this valve on top of here it's probably the equivalent of what we would call a pass transistor so it's probably some form of a, a follower valve with maybe a voltage comparator built into it as well I haven't had a look at the circuit diagram yet so I'm not certain so we've also got another PCP mounted on the side of the instrument and uh, just reading the number on it, it's a 12AT7. So I think in, a, in old money we would call that an ECC81 over here, wouldn't we? 
So from memory, that's a, that's a double triode valve. So I'm guessing that this is actually being used to do the uh, the measurement. So of course, in an analog meter, you've got both your test leads, your red and your black, your input leads, and they're connected to the meter movement with just a few probably resistors between that and the meter movement. Whereas if you're using an electronic meter like this, well, it actually doesn't matter if it's a modern uh, digital voltmeter or this electronic voltmeter for that matter. The actual test leads of the instruments, they're not directly connected to the meter movement. They're actually um, buffered by, I'm guessing, these valves here. And I think typically the arrangement is in some form of um, bridge arrangement where the input voltage that you're measuring actually unbalances the bridge. Now, I guess if you're using a modern digital voltmeter, the, the input to your meter, it's probably got some resistors and things in the way, much like an analog meter, but the actual thing that does the measurement, it's probably got a field effect transistor, which, uh, again, they're very high impedance devices, whereas, again, what the test leads are connected probably to these valves here, they're connected into the grid, and, of course, the grid of a valve is uh, it's incredibly high impedance, probably much higher than a FET. Typically, valve input impedances can be in the uh, gig ohms rather than in the even hundreds of mega ohms. We can also see that a fair percentage of the circuit board here and here and here, it's all actually populated by what look like very high precision wire wound resistors. And again, if we turn the instrument over to where the actual uh, range selection switch is, again, we can see it's similarly um, populated with quite high precision resistors. Let me just turn it around. So hopefully you can see here, these are what I would call high precision resistors. You can actually see a 1K one there. I wonder if we could just measure that 1K, see what my digital meter makes of it. Now, of course, we don't actually know if these uh, 1K resistors have got other things in circuit with them that might pull the reading. OK, so that's reading 9.98 uh, kilo ohms. So that's pretty good, isn't it? I can see there's a resistor above it that says 10K. Let's check that one. Again, that says 10.01. So yes, these are precision resistors. So I'm just taking a look at the back of the meter movement here. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, this meter isn't directly connected to your test leads, unlike an analog meter is. It's actually connected. It's actually, the meter's actually being driven by the valve output stage. But I can actually see across the meter, I can see some diodes, a resistor, and there's a kind of a round disc component, which uh, to me that looks like a Fermistor or a PTC device. I'm not exactly sure, but I'm guessing the, these couple of diodes here are probably some form of meter protection. But one of the things about using these valve voltmeters, because the meter isn't directly connected to the circuit under test, they're actually very robust. I think in theory you can't really damage these meters because if you just put too much voltage in, well it just goes into the grid of the valve and the, you know a valve just doesn't really care. It'll just go, mm, okay, you know I don't really care if it is 500 volts or 2 volts, you're not going to damage the grid of a valve. As long as the uh, valve doesn't pass too much uh, anode current, it really doesn't care what voltage is on the grid. Again, what a thing of beauty. I can see that this uh, transformer here, it's got all the windings, it's got all the voltages, but they're actually handwritten in place. So again, it just shows there was a, there was a lot of hand building in here. Um, I guess that's something we've got to check, isn't it? That it's actually set to the uh, the right voltage. I don't think I've seen a, a link set up quite as complicated as that. I'll just have to check the manual, make sure that's right. I've uh, also got a big pass transistor there, so it's kind of uh, it's interesting, isn't it, that we've got a combination here of uh, of solid state. We've got diodes, and uh, I've spotted some transistors over here. Uh, what's that? BFY51 bipolar transistor. Um, so we've got a combination here of uh, of both valves and uh, and solid state components. So uh, yeah, interesting hybrid, really, isn't it? OK, what I think I'm going to do is I'm just going to check that these links are correct and then we'll put a plug on it and I think we might just try and power the thing up and see what happens. Well, I think the best thing to do with this is probably treat it like a valve radio. It does have a solid state rectifier, I think, so uh, we should be getting some DC onto these capacitors relatively quickly. So what I think we'll do is we'll turn the voltage up slowly and uh, we'll just see if it suddenly starts to draw more current or something like that. <sighs> OK, so we're at about... what's that? about 70 volts and uh, the neon is struck already. I didn't think uh, neon's struck at such a low voltage, but yeah, it's glowing there. Hopefully you can see that little red light. 
So it's drawing at the moment, it's drawing about 8 watts, 9 watts. Oh, we've got some needle action. So it's doing something. Okay, so we're at about, I reckon about 230 volts there. Uh, Oh, so we've got some zeroing action. I actually thought this would pretty much just work because, yeah, Marconi equipment, what can you say? The quality is there. So in theory, I think we just use this probe now. So if I touch this to the top of the battery, does anything happen? Oh, <laughs> and it does. And uh, what does it indicate there? I'll make sure I'm on the right scale. Well, it's indicating, I think, yeah, I'm on the right scale, 10 volt scale. Well, it's indicating about, I think that's about 9.2 volts, which is probably about right. Oh, lovely damp meter action there. Well, basically, that just works. I wonder if the uh, Holmes range works. I suspect it will do. I assume we've got to turn that onto there. And that's got an ohms range button. Oh, I've got to also just change ohms on this probe here. So it appears that our ohms range isn't quite zeroing out. Looks like there could be an adjustment pot in here, maybe. Will that adjust the ohm zero? Oh, maybe it sets over end. Okay, yeah. So I think our ohms range could be slightly out. The needle isn't going quite to the zero mark. But then again, these are probes and uh, these crocodile clips are still a bit grubby and dirty, so that could be it. Almost going to zero, but not quite. And I'd actually forgotten, it's been so long since I've actually used an analogue meter in anger. Of course, they, they kind of read in reverse. The needle goes the opposite way around. So previously, we went ahead and we did a quick check of the uh, DC range, and we just saw that the ohms range seemed to be doing something, so I think they were working. But one thing that I haven't checked is I haven't checked the AC range. Reading the manual, it turns out that this probe here is not actually used for the AC range. You don't use this, so we'll just put this to one side. It turns out that you actually have to use this... Um, well, this strange looking device here. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, this has actually got a valve in the, uh, in the input end, which I think acts as a buffer. I think the idea is that when you're dealing with AC at particular high frequencies, it's not really things like resistance that cause you a problem. It's things like capacitance. And uh, the capacitance of uh, flying leads and even things like oscilloscope probes and stuff like that, they can uh, present very, very considerable loading to a circuit. But I think the idea of this uh, AC probe is that it presents... Uh, a very very low loading in fact well I should say it presents low capacitance I think it says that the capacitance tip is only two picofarads so the idea is if you actually use this it won't actually load the AC circuit under test actually just picking this thing up it's actually pretty hot to hold and uh, of course it's probably not surprising that because it's actually got a valve in the in the tip here and uh, yeah the valve is getting really hot and, uh, yeah, I tried to open this earlier to have a look inside, but I couldn't do it. Anyway, I've tried to just feed an AC signal into this, and uh, I've got my uh, signal generator here, and uh, this is set to produce a 1 kilohertz sine wave at 12 volts peak to peak. So that should be just about over 4 volts RMS. And uh, my understanding is at relatively low frequencies, you can actually feed the A signal in. You can use this common clip here and uh, feed a signal in. And uh, we get a little bit of deflection, but yeah, not very much. You're not seeing 4 volts there. Or you can actually also connect to the body of this probe here for high frequency reading. So I can try that as well. But the, uh, the needle is barely reading, so I'm expecting a deflection somewhere down here of about 4 volts. So I'm on the 3 volt range at the moment. Let's try the 1 volt range. Well, it deflects a little bit more. And we put it on the 0.3 volt range. Yeah, it goes a little bit further as well. 
But um, yeah, it's uh, it also seems to be well. Could there be a bad connection on the lead? Certainly, I don't think our AC probe is. You know, I don't think it's working as it should. Of course, it could just be operator error that maybe I just don't know how to operate this instrument correctly. I have read the manual now, but I wouldn't say that the uh, the manual is particularly intuitive. It's one of them manuals that really assumes you know what you're doing, and as you've come to know, I've got no idea what I'm doing. Now, this probe is actually designed to come apart, and I uh, have been trying to get it apart without too much uh, success. So I'm about to uh, I'm about to get medieval on it, I'm afraid, because I've kind of tried everything else. I'm sure that this shouldn't actually be tight, but it, it does appear to be. <sighs> yeah, that's absolutely solid. I'm absolutely sh sure that this thing should just split apart here. This is a very delicate piece of equipment, so it shouldn't be necessary to do this, but uh, if it won't come apart, what can we do? Well, the other thing I can think to do is go and find another pair of uh, pliers. And uh, oh, God, that's strange. Must have, must have loosened it after all. There we go. It just went there. So just taking a look inside our AC probe here, it looks as though it's been stored underwater for several years, and uh, I suspect maybe that's why it isn't actually working properly. Well, I suspect the first thing to do is just try and give it a bit of a clean, see if it responds to that. Well hopefully you can see here I've given our detector probe a really good clean and uh, I was very careful not to lose any parts, I did it all in a dish. But it does actually turn out that we've uh, unfortunately we've got some parts missing. So if I just show you the exploded diagram here, you can see that we've actually got item 6 which is uh, it's stuck on the end of the valve here and that's got the resistor going to it. But what we do seem to be missing is we're missing capacitor C1. We're also missing a little sleeve, which is item 5. We're missing item 4, and we're missing a, co a contact spring, which is item 3. So it's probably not surprising that this probe doesn't work, because, um, yeah, it, it's missing so many parts. So I don't really know where that leaves us. I think perhaps we should just have a go, because this is scrap, and it's not like I'm going to be able to be able to just to ring up Marconi and ask them for these replacement parts now, is it? So I think all we can do is just see if we can try to uh, bodge something together, see if that's possible. I'm not sure how well it's going to show up on camera, but hopefully you can see this little valve here, which is a, I believe it's actually a detector, it's a rectifier, and uh, you can actually see it glowing quite brightly, and uh, that probably explains why this AC probe does get so hot when it's in use. So I had a look at the uh, parts list and it appears that the part that we're missing, it's a flat disc which actually forms, I think it's a, a 0 0.01 microfarad capacitor. Well, I've just gone ahead and I've got a capacitor out of the junk box which is 0 0.01 microfarad. And uh, hopefully if we touch this to here we should actually get a reading. Now I am getting a reading, or it does work on occasions, but I think maybe the... Uh, there's also a broken wire on the probe or something. Um, somehow we're getting a bad connection. Sometimes it seems to work. Sometimes it doesn't. Okay, there we go. If you just kind of hold your tongue at the right angle, you do get a measurement of about 4.5 volts, which uh, I think is about right. That's what we should be expecting. But, uh, yeah, it's just difficult to narrow it down. I think the fault might actually be in this flex here. Obviously, we still need to install the capacitor in the end, but um, 
the needle just waves around a lot. I'm kind of wondering if there's a, a bad connection. I mean, you would typically expect a bad connection in here because that's the part of the wire that gets flexed a lot. Just wondering if we can bear this back a bit and re-terminate it. I think it's worth a try. So I can see this cable's got a screen on it, but the screen is uh, it's in a real mess. It's all green and contaminated. Looks as though it's badly oxidised. I think while we've got the cable disconnected, we might as well just try and bell it out. Okay, and for some reason this black cable, again the cores in it, when you look at them, they're, uh, the copper is very corroding. Again, it's very black inside. I think that should be the black one, that should be the screen. Okay, that doesn't seem intermittent, does it? What's the next one? Let's try the red one next. Nope, red connection seems okay. What's the next one? Yellow. Yep, yellow seems okay as well. So I went ahead and I've made off the cable again and I found that I'm still getting an intermittent meter reading and uh, what I found was after a bit more poking around I found that when I actually touched the valve itself that was actually what was causing the intermittent reading. Now I could see that this valve it's got can you just see that it's got like a gold sleeve around it well that gold sleeve is actually joined onto the valve and it turns out that for this EA52 this little miniature mullard valve this ring here is actually the cathode connection and then this grey piece of metal behind it I think this is just some form of holder so the problem is we're actually getting an intermittent cathode connection to the valve now I've taken one of my little very pointy um, test probes here and I've kind of jammed it in between the, the holder and the cathode connection on the valve and now we do seem to be getting a very steady meter reading so I think probably the problem is unless this probe is fully assembled and it's got some spring pressure pressing the valve back into this holder here we're not going to get a good connection well I've got to admit I don't know if this is a good idea or a stupid idea but I think it'll be quite difficult to arrange some spring pressure to put this valve back into its holder so I'm just wondering if this gold collar if I can actually solder to it and uh, maybe I can just directly solder a little cathode wire on I'm not sure it's the only thing I can think of Yes, it does in fact take solder, so that's something. Yeah, I think that's got it. At least now we've soldered this little uh, bodge wire in, this little link wire, it should at least test the theory that that's the problem because we should have you now removed that loose connection. I'm just hoping that the valve doesn't get so hot that it unsolders itself. I don't think it will. So the question is, does the reading stay solid? Yes, it does. So, yeah, there was obviously no problem with that. It's just the fact it needed some spring pressure. Um, now, I don't think we're going to be able to arrange to put that spring pressure back. I mean, we're going to have to bodge a capacitor on the end of here, but probably to put a capacitor in a spring and then have it push within this cat, I think that's a bit of a tall order. So I think what I'd like to do next is change out some of these capacitors, but I'm not at all sure that I can... Uh, get all these screws to actually get the board out so uh, I'm just undoing a few of them to see if that's possible Normally Marconi equipment is designed to be really accessible, but yeah, this one not so much Okay, time for a little bit of snippy snip snip time 8 microfarad at 350 volts. I haven't got any of them. I'll have to order some of them The 
This one is also 8 microfarad at 350 volts. So these are, I said they were Philips, didn't I, earlier in the video? They're not Philips, they are actually Plessy. Now I know it's a bit of a contentious subject, changing out electrolytics, but I'm going to give you my take on it. The life of an electrolytic capacitor is 10 years. Um, yes, they can last longer, but the life is 10 years, and that's why I'm changing them out. I'm being a bit delicate with these circuit boards, because these are brown Bakelite ones. The tracks lift very, very easily on them. And I'm kind of taking these out old school way just because I really haven't got room to get a solder sucker in. And using solder braid I do think it's just a little bit kinder than it is going in with a solder sucker. I wonder if any of you have ever tried using those desoldering needles. I've seen them used on other channels and to be honest they don't look very good to me but um, if you've used those desoldering needles let me know. I'd be interested to know how you get on with them. So here we have all the capacitors that we've removed from our electronic voltmeter and uh, they are made by Plessy and uh, this one has got a date code on it so this was actually made in October of uh, 1965. Now I actually thought that this instrument was probably early 70s um, but it is actually a bit earlier than that it obviously is probably from around October 65 or at least that's where when the capacitor was made. I just wondered these other capacitors have got any date codes on them either. No, nope, I don't think I can see a date code on that one. And uh, yeah, I don't think I can see a, a date code on this one either. Oh, actually, that one's a Hunt's one. Well, actually, it looks as though we've actually got a bit of a mix and match going on with capacitors because this one is a this one's a Hunt's capacitor. I'm trying to read the uh, name on this one. It says it's made in England. It looks like something like Master. I can't make out the writing, it's something capacitor made in England. So both these two blue ones are 8 microfarads and uh, they're both, yeah, both 350 volts DC working. Whereas this big orange Plessy capacitor is uh, 2,500 microfarads and it's only 25 volts working. So let's just give these uh, a quick test. It's always interesting to see how these things have survived over the years. So looking at our capacitance value, it has gone up from 2,500 to 2,900. That's maybe still in specification. Let's have a look at the ESR. So the ESR is coming up as a 0.26. So I'm just going to have to look that up on my chart here. So we're looking for something. Well, the nearest one we've got is 2,200. And uh, 2,200, 25 volts. Well, it actually says that the SR should be 0 0.06. So we're actually um, we're an order of magnitude above that with an ESR value of 0 0.16. So yes, the ESR value has definitely gone up. And finally, let's just check these two blue coloured capacitors. Now, both of these are. 350 volts DC working and they're both 8 microfarads but different manufacturers. One of them can't read, looks very much like Master but I'm not sure. But the other one is a Hunts. But they appear pretty much identical as though, yeah, they look as though they must have come out the uh, the same factory because just everything about them is, is identical. They, they must be the uh, same capacitor. Anyway, let's give the... Uh, Hunt's branded one a try first. Okay, so that's come up as a uh, 10 microfarads rather than 8 microfarads. That's probably still within specification and that's got an ESR of 0.92. Well, that seems pretty low because just looking at my capacitor ESR value chart, I can actually see that for a 10 microfarad capacitor at 400 volts, which is a little bit higher than these, but the nearest I've got on my chart, it says it can actually be up to 5.3 ohms. So it's well within that. Let's try the, uh, the other one. Okay, this one has come up 10 microfarads. Again, pretty bang on 10 actually, but the ESR is a little bit higher in that it's 1.2. So I think the ESR of this one's about double, isn't it? Let's just double check. 1.16. So they're not a million miles apart, are they? They're actually fairly close. So none of these capacitors look totally awful, but my view is 10 years is about the life of a capacitor. Now lots of things do affect the life of a capacitor. Things like the voltage the capacitor has actually been run at. Has it been run near its maximum voltage? 
what's the uh, the ripple current things like that probably the biggest one is actually the temperature the higher the temperature that these have been exposed to the more the life will have been reduced and I suppose we don't actually know how much this electronic voltmeter has been used whether it's been used for a couple of hours or thousands of hours we've got no idea but yeah my rule of thumb for a capacitor is about 10 years so these things are well they're probably not far off uh, 55 years old now are they so I think they were due for changing out that's what I've done um, leave it in the comments especially if you disagree leave it in the comments well I think rain is going to stop play because I've had to put some capacitors in order because we don't have any in stock so this is going to have to wait till we get some capacitors now and while we wait for those capacitors to arrive I've got to think of some way of a jury rigging up this AC probe so what we're going to have to do is we've got to get about 10 nanofarads of capacitance onto the end of this probe here for the coupling capacitor now I've got one of these uh, one of these poly capacitors here and we've also got a, a ceramic multi-layer capacitor here I kind of suspect that the ceramic capacitor has probably in some ways a better choice I suspect that that would have a, a lower inductance value in circuit which is going to affect the uh, the high frequency measuring ability of this instrument but I actually think it would be more or less impossible to actually uh, to get this in now amazingly enough the part that we're missing does actually look a lot like this capacitor it does look like a flat disc and uh, it has a hole in the middle like a polo mint so it actually sits on the end of this spike here and then a spring couples one side of the capacitor to the end of the probe here I don't think we're going to be able to lash that up I think it's more likely we're going to end up somehow grafting this little uh, poly capacitor onto the end of the cap don't know how we're going to achieve that yet um, hmm, not sure I'm gonna to have to give that some thinking about but uh, yeah maybe your ideas would be useful so if you've got any thoughts on this again help me out leave it in the comments what's the best way to actually get this uh, put back together I'm not sure but I think for today we've probably run out of time so as always thanks very much for watching and I hope to see you all very soon until then bye bye for now <laughs>